here. You are listening to the Trips and Global on Wheels Podcast Hour, the place to be to learn about the latest and greatest life stories from people who are doing incredible disability advocacy work. Karen Breitmeyer, thank you so much for coming on the Trips and Global on Wheels Podcast Hour. Thank you for having me. Karen Breitmeyer is the founder and managing principal of Studio Pacifica. She provides the unusual combination of personal experience as a registered architect and a member of the disabled community. She has made accessibility consulting and design services her focus area since 1990. She provides consulting services to local governments, school districts, architects, engineers, companies and individuals concerned with complying with federal laws and state codes, as well as simply creating spaces that work for the unique needs of individual users. So can you share with us uh, what your disability is? Oh, sure. I have osteogenesis imperfecta, which is a collagen disorder. And when I was young, it manifested itself in um, a bone fragility. I also have significant hearing loss. So you have both a, a physical disability and a invisible disability. You have lenses into a couple of the different worlds. Yes. So I know that you have a daughter that also uses a wheelchair, right? That is correct. Um, so how is navigating around the physical environment with two wheelchairs? I know that, you know, oftentimes, at least from my experience as a manual wheelchair user, oftentimes buses only allow two wheelchairs. And, um, and one of the spots oftentimes are filled. And so how do you handle these kinds of situations when you two are traveling together? That is a great question. I, I do think that the laws rarely take into consideration the fact that um, people with disabilities have families or might uh, be traveling with friends. Um, and so uh, you, you need to have enough space to accommodate. And how do you think the situation is now over the last you know, 20 years, 20, 30 years that you've been raising your daughter? Has, has the physical environment changed, improved? even just in the Seattle area? Um, I would like to say that people are being thoughtful. The regulations really have not required that aspect. How was raising a daughter with a physical disability as someone who also has a physical disability and is in a wheelchair? I think being a parent with a disability is always... Um, well, I think being a parent is always a big job and it's a challenge. So no matter what, <laughs> um, the, the added complication or maybe it's not a complication, maybe complexity um, thing that you have to work around of having two wheelchair users or um, whatever. I mean, it just added, um, it, it was problems that needed to be solved and we took each one at a time. Little things like when she um, was young and um, uh, we, we made sure that we got her into a wheelchair as quickly as possible because I find strollers are very difficult to push and wheelchairs are much more rigid and much easier to push. And in those days, I was using a manual chair. So I was having to push to wheel with one hand and push her with the other. Um, I, I think at home it was not difficult because we already had a house that was wheelchair friendly. I have always raised my daughter. We used to say all the time that, you know, when you're a wheelchair girl, wheelchair girl, um, you have to be creative. And so we would run into these obstacles and we'd stop and we'd say, okay, now's where we get to be creative. And I really do feel like, you know, there's a way out of almost every barrier or around every barrier. Um, so before deciding to become a parent, what do wheelchair users have to take into consideration in terms of not only for yourself, but also for the child that, that would be coming into the family, your family? 
so my husband and I chose to expand our family through adoption. And so Anita came home to us when she was um, just before her fourth birthday. For, for us, it was just the right time. Um, what are the things that we had to do or had to think about? We did some specific things to, to our, the bathroom that we were gonna use so that we had enough room to be able to get two wheelchairs into the bathroom and get up next to the tub because kids like to take baths and um, we made sure that there was a sink that she could roll up to. Um, and we did a few things to her bedroom, but really I don't think we did any, anything that other parents don't do, you know, make, make sure the house is safe and stuff. I think the biggest barrier that parents with disabilities face about bringing, you know, increasing their family and adding children is attitudinal. And, and I think there are so many people that think, oh, I don't know if you can do that, or um, I, 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 will the child be safe with you at home? Those are great insights. And when you decided to adopt, was it intentional to adopt someone with a disability? Was that a criteria of yours? We certainly were open to it. I, I, um, I think there are so, and my husband and I feel strongly, there are so many children out there who are uh, waiting and uh, deserve families. And our home is, is um, wheelchair friendly and what better place they could be than I think um, with a family that understood and accepted um, her, her mobility differences. Yeah, I'm adopted as well, so I can ah. definitely relay from a children's perspective, I suppose. Um, so I want to ask you about, um, in terms of the approval process, as you know, adopting from anywhere, China, India, there's a lot of paperwork and there's a lot of waiting. And so, and sometimes, you know, with people with disabilities, the waiting time may, may not be as long, long. I know for me, from my personal experience, um, my parents had to didn't have to wait as long as if they were adamant about adopting an able-bodied person, you know, somebody who didn't have a physical disabilities. And so my waiting process and their waiting process wasn't as long. And, you know, my parents both are, uh, they don't have a disability. So I think that process may or may not have been easier. So what was your experience with that, with the approval process, the paperwork, the, you know, child services, right. all of that? So, uh, well, and our adoption was, you know, 18 plus years ago. So the information I have may not align very well with international adoption today. I think pay, it, there's always been a ton of paperwork and there will probably always be a ton of paperwork. Today, um, all of international adoption, regardless of what country you're coming through, goes through ebbs and flows in terms of whether the, the country that the children are living in um, is open to um, uh, um, Americans coming in and adopting. So it's an ever-changing landscape. Yeah, those are great points. So I guess what I was trying to ask in the last question was, did you feel like your disability affected the process at all? Boy, that is certainly um, a big barrier. In our case, I reached out to a wide range of adoption <laughs> agencies that we did not work with an agency local to us. We worked with an agency halfway across the country. Um, and we did all of our communication uh, by email and phone. If you're a person with disability and you really want to pursue adoption, I think you just need to keep looking for the agency that's open to you and open to your needs. And don't feel restricted to somebody who's local. I think what I'm hearing is don't put your eggs all in one basket, right? Try to um, connect with multiple organizations. Oh yeah, and uh, talk to as many different agencies as you can before you select one and and you're really looking for a supportive group. And in our case, we we found the match between the supportive US agency and the supportive in-country um, agency. And that is that's the magic that you're looking for to happen.
Mm, I see, I see. Okay, so that was very, in, very enlightening, very insightful. Um, I want to move on to architecture, which, you know, you've devoted so much of your life to um, and still going. So I know you've worked on, on some really big projects at Space Needle, Pikes Peak Market. Um, can you just share with us what, um, what you did in these big projects and how you made it more accessible to us, to individuals with disabilities like us? Sure. Um, well, first of all, we have had the great pleasure and honor of working with some of the, the top architecture firms here in the Pacific Northwest and, and across the country. Um, we provide consulting services, which means that we join a project team to help them um, review their thoughts, their design process, to be sure first that it meets like the codes and regulations. And then I think what makes us a little different from our colleagues is that we really take um, time to look at the project, think about what the architect's goals are, and then recommend ways to maybe go beyond those minimum codes. You know, the codes say a ramp should be, you know, a slope of, of 1 in 12. Well, that's the maximum, right? That's, that's the highest slope you can get. Well, why would we encourage people to design at the steepest when you might be able to do it at less? And it's great fun. Yeah. Can you share some spe specific examples from either the Space Needle or Pikes Peak Market where areas have been improved? Oh, I, well, I think the Space Needle renovation, that was an, such an exciting project. For people who may or may not know, the Space Needle is a, um, an iconic observation tower that uh, was designed for the World's Fair. You rise up on elevators to an observation deck that's 500 and something feet in the air. I might have my numbers wrong, but way up there. And it used to have a, it, and then it, from that observation deck, you step down a few steps to an outside ring that you can go out and there were these glass panels you can look down. Um, and then there was a platform lift that only worked really intermittently. And so that most, for all the years I think I've lived in Seattle, I'd never ever gone to the outside observation deck. And in the renovation, we um, encouraged the architects to put in a, a, a unique product that um, creates a platform lift that sort of appears out of a set of stairs. So it, it kept the sort of historic quality of the interior of the space, but it works, which is so awesome. And now anybody who uses a mobility device can get out to that outside observation deck. And then the architects chose to take the glass walls around that outside observation deck and drop them all the way to the floor level. So it is really a, it's, it's a breathtaking view. That has been very, very satisfying to me because now <laughs> everybody gets to go out and go, ah! <laughs> <laughs> be excited and thrilled or whatever yeah how awesome so I've been there before a number of years ago but I'll have to go again to check it and check it out yeah yeah <laughs> so uh, moving on to disability advocacy so during one of your talks I know you were surprised to be called an activist you know a disability activist and so how have you worked to include people with disabilities in architecture programs? And if there have been any results that you've been especially proud of? Oh, well, I, um, I have been a supporter and a mentor to a program here at the University of Washington. It's, uh, the acronym is DO IT. And it's, um, I, I'm not sure I can um, tell you accurately what those letters stand for, D O hyphen IT, but it's a program for young people <clears throat> with disabilities um, 
who are considering college in their high school years and brings them together um, for a couple of weeks on the University of Washington campus and they learn um, in part about career options in the STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, in the STEM area, as well as learning how to advocate for themselves on campus in their future college years. Um, and I've been an a mentor to them, um, really trying to expand their perception that um, I think of architecture as a part of the STEM um, uh, career base. And, and so over the years, I've had the opportunity to encourage a, 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 you know, some young people who participated in that program annually. I've seen a lot of those kids turn into very talented uh, professionals. That's wonderful. So I think, so you said it's a, it's a program at UW. Have you uh, or them thought about taking the program, you know, the people that are in charge of this program, taking it national to other schools in, in the U.S.? You know, I, that you would have to ask them about. I think it's a very special uh, program, so I have no idea if it would, if you could, um, you know, expand it. Um, or if there aren't other programs like that in other universities, I'm I, I'm just involved in the one that's close to, close to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. So because I'm sure there are there are other architects with disabilities who would be willing to join programs like that, right? I would I would hope so. <laughs> so how can we train able-bodied people to be more? aware of our architectural needs for people with disabilities. Do you think it's something that can be taught or do you really have to have the lived experience? I definitely think it can be taught and certainly we can expand architects um, understanding and empathy of the needs. I think um, the I serve on the US Access Board, which is an independent federal agency that um, develops the guidelines for the federal government on accessibility. And they have uh, recently been developing a whole series of animations that um, illustrate how people with um, mobility and other disabilities move through our environment. Hope because, you know, architects are very visual and it really helps them see if they can see what people go through and then they kind of go, oh, yeah. Um, so I really encourage people to um, go to the Access Board website and, and spend time on those animations. And I certainly have been sharing those with my professional colleagues as, as a good training. Yes, um, so it's definitely something that could be learned if they are willing. What accessories would you like to see on the market? You're not having been a wheelchair user and I mean a manual wheelchair user and then now transitioning to an electric wheelchair right? Mm -hmm. Correct. The biggest challenge um, as a power chair user is being able to carry um, the gear that I need to carry on the chair safely. I think weather protection is another big uh, issue. Coming up with stylish and and uh, easy to store, um, whether it's a, a raincoat or lap protection. Those are those are questions in my mind. I was wondering, when did you transition from a manual to an electric chair? Um, and about, why, why did you make that decision? Oh, um, I transitioned from a manual chair to a power chair outside of the house um, about two years ago. And I did it um, in, in large part because I have um, significant arthritis in my shoulders from um, lots of years of pushing. And uh, I encourage you as a young person using a manual chair to ensure that your the ergonomics in your push are as good as they can be because you want those shoulders to last you as long <laughs> as they can. So when I was a kid, I nobody paid any attention to whether you were in the right size wheelchair or pushing in a safe way so 
I think my shoulders uh, are suffering from that. Mm, I see. But you still use a manual wheelchair at home, right? Yeah, yeah. It's more comfortable. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so that's definitely been an issue across the board with, they say, I think I read a fig figure somewhere that 70 to 80% of all wheelchair users experience some sort of shoulder pain, chronic pain of some sort and have to sometimes have to have surgery. Yeah, I'm yeah, trying really hard not to go there. Yeah. I am, <laughs> please. Yeah, 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 no, understandable, me too. Um, I think in terms of those kind of, ex since, especially since you've had so decades of, of experience of using a manual wheelchair and knowing, you know, looking back what you could have done better, um, what are some tips that you can give younger generations to avoid some of the, you know, issues that um, older generations are facing? Um, like yourself, you were saying you were sharing about your shoulder pain and how if you were fitted better in a, in a wheelchair that was more appropriate for your size, then that could have, you know, prevented some of the pain or delayed it. Yes, absolutely. I, I'm um, very adamant, um, and I was when, even when my daughter was four, uh, that she get the best uh, wheelchair fit that we could at the time, and that even then she would be pushing the lightest wheelchair that she could um, so that there was less wear and tear on her shoulders. I also support, the cons if, if you can do it, um, the addition of adding some kind of a power assist as soon as you might need it. So um, devices like um, the Firefly, which is a clip-on, um, turns your uh, manual chair into a like a scooter or um, some of the other, I mean, there's a wide variety of devices out there. Um, if you're gonna be pushing long and hard um, to get across a college campus or on your daily commute, um, anything you can do to um, to um, reduce wear and tear, you do still need to exercise. And that, that's the great thing about, you know, uh, continuing to push a manual chair is that you get your exercise, but you want to do it in a, in, in a, a safe and ergonomic fashion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think one, one last thing I want to address before I ask you the last question is, um, as you're as you may be familiar with, um, around 70% of the country's um, people with disabilities are unemployed. Um, I think to be a person of your position who is specialized in a field, architecture, and be you know, economically thriving, um, and just living a very full and uh, happy life, that is, it's, it's great to see, and I, I wish these kinds of images and people like you are on TV or on platforms that people with disabilities um, log on to. And so what, what is your advice for, in terms of make, uh, gaining uh, economic stability and living a thriving life in terms of finding a career path and not be, um, not not be in a situation where many people with disabilities are, where they are living on, you know, on minimal minimal social welfare, and also in a predict predicament where they're unable to or feel like they're unable to pursue an, a career path. Uh, that is such a difficult question. And I certainly, if, if there was an easy answer, we would like to think that people would have, um, would be espousing that and that people with disabilities would be employed. I, I think um, I, I work with um, employers to have them consider opening uh, their eyes to the benefits of employing people with disabilities. Um, I think so many of the barriers that people with disabilities face are attitudinal um, and that some employers uh, feel very nervous or challenged about um, what they might have to do to their workplace to uh, engage people with disabilities. 
a large part of that is because of attitudinal barriers? That would be my observation. Okay, so on to our last question. This has lasted way longer than I thought, but but you've been so you've been so fascinating and insightful. So as I mentioned, even throughout the interview, I've observed you have such a contagious laugh. You just have this really great joy about you, and um, and as you know, and I know, there are so much that is inaccessible out there, and. Um, you know, what keeps you so optimistic still, you know, and curious and confident about life in the future? And uh, even despite uh, these high unemployment rates, you're still very much hopeful, hopeful about change and the, in progress in the future. Oh, gosh, I, I, I think it's just the way I am to be like I tend to be a glass half full kind of person um, I I feel like um, there has been so much change since I was a kid you know when I was growing up there were no curb cuts there were no accessible parking spaces certainly not you know couldn't get on the city bus and so I think now oh my god the world has changed so much and the world that my daughter is growing up in is so different from mine. Now, are there still things out there, you know, that I think, really, is that still happening? Um, yes, there are, um, but there has been positive change. And so that encourages me. Um, uh, and I th I'm so excited that young people like you and others in my community are taking up the the banner and saying, no, we're not done yet. We have work left to do. Um, we deserve uh, the place that we have a right to be involved in our communities, to be employed, to go to school, to um, go to a restaurant and be able to use the bathroom just like everybody else, right? So um, that is what keeps me encouraged and, um, for a while there, I, I thought, oh, you know, many of our well-known disability advocates or my, my peers are older and, and maybe, you know, maybe this is going to die out. And so I'm just thrilled to see like the next generation come along and keep that fire burning. We need to keep it going. And I think we're so lucky. One thing I love about this project, hosting this podcast show, is talking to so many people like yourself. Um, even as I was doing research about you, I just felt so hopeful. And so um, you opened the new lens of living for me. Um, growing up like yourself, I was the only wheelchair user. And everywhere I went, I was the only one, not only because of my wheelchair, but because of my race, um, having, being majority white. Um, in the community that I grew up in and so and you know I, I, you know the the portrayal of a person with a disability or someone in a wheelchair in movies or in TV shows are not all that positive even today there has been some progress but not not as fast as we would like I would like and uh, and just getting to know you and getting to talk to you and just learning about what you've been up to um, just opens a whole new perspective, opens a whole new horizon. So thank you so much for taking the time. It's been, it's been really an honor. Thank you so much for your time and being so generous and insightful. And hopefully when I come to Seattle, we'll meet in person for coffee or tea. That would be lovely. Thank you very much for the opportunity to chat with you, Ming. It's been a pleasure. Of course, and happy Halloween. Where's your costume? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I <forgot about> that. <laughs> All right. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Did you like this video? If so, share with your friends and be sure to follow us on social media. And if you want even more resources, be sure to sign up for our email updates on our website, traipsingglobal.com. Keep learning new perspectives. 
Keep being inclusive because it will make the world a better place for you and for everyone else. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch you on another episode of the Trips and Global on Wheels Podcast Hour.